Thanks for joining us. This is our extended interview with Ernie Svensson, also known as Ernie the Attorney. The first part of this video is from our GNGF Live that happens every other Wednesday. The second part here in this bonus extended interview, we dive into some of Ernie's best tips on how law firm owners can grow their law firm and gain more time to do the things they love to do. If you already saw the live, I'll put a timestamp to the exclusive extended interview below. And be sure to like and subscribe to follow along with all our great conversations on legal marketing and the business side of running a law firm. And to watch this video on your platform of choice, you can find everywhere we stream at gngf.tv. Okay, let's get to the interview. Welcome to GNGF Live, your bi-weekly Ask the Experts about all things law firm marketing and business growth. I'm Mark Homer, author of Online Law Practice Strategies and founder of Get Notice, Get Found. I'm excited today to be joined by Ernie Svensson. Of course, I've always known him as Ernie the Attorney. Uh, I met Ernie about 10 years ago in Louisiana, and we've seen each other over the years as speakers at different legal events around the country. I know he's extremely busy these days as someone who produces an amazing amount of content for law firm owners, running events and boot camps, and coaching law firm clients. So I'm glad he was able to take the time to sit down and provide some great insight for all of you guys. Before we get to the interview, please take a second to like and subscribe to our page, not just a video. That way you can get updated when our next episode goes live. I'll pause a second so you can find that like and subscribe button. Of course, it never hurts for you to show a little love and smash that like button on the video right now too. And as always, we've got moderators in the chat, so please ask questions and interact while we're live. And if you're watching this in the future, after we're live, we do monitor the comments on Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn, and we'll work to reach out to our guests to answer any follow-up questions you have. That's because we love you all, and we love getting to meet you in person. So come see us. Here's where we're gonna be next. First up, next week, March 16th through 18th, I'll be in Atlanta helping lawyers redesign their practice from the ground up at Lawyerist LabCon. March 25th through 27th, Josh and I will be in Denver, Colorado at the Legal Marketing Association's annual event. April 1st through 3rd, backed by popular demand, G and Jeff is proud to be joining four other great legal marketing agencies in Las Vegas to put on the Best Damn Legal Marketing Conference, or Bedlam 2020. Man, that was such a great conference last year, Daniel. I think we have uh, 50 people I saw signed up. So, um, so if you if you want to go, there's uh, I think we have room for 75. So reach out to us, Daniel. If you can drop an email, uh, Josh's email in there, they can reach out. Um, Josh can give you a $200 off discount. May 7th and 8th, Josh and I will be on the road again in New Orleans where we're speaking at the Small Firm Boot Camp. Our guest today, Ernie the Attorney, is actually putting this on and he'll be talking about this today. So I'll let him talk all about this awesome event in a few minutes. So May 15th, I'm going to be speaking at the DC Bar Practice 360 event as well. Whew, that's only uh, the next couple of months and doesn't include a few webinars and uh, about a half a dozen awesome guests I have uh, lined up for these Facebook Lives. So. If you aren't following our page, which you should, you may not have noticed, but we started a new video series at the end of last year we called GNGF Tips. So check it out on our YouTube page. Daniel, um, can you throw a link to the latest one where I talk about you know, like PPC and tactics? Uh, people are probably wondering where Joe is today. Uh, so he's on vacation. So a big shout out to producer Daniel Parrish, who's doing double duty today. Uh, so check him out. We drop a new GNGF Tips video every other Friday. All right, let's get to the interview. Ernie the attorney. <laughs> Thanks for hey. joining me today. Thanks for having me, man. It's great to be here. Yeah, looking uh, looking forward to this interview. And um, I, you know, we had recently done a webinar together, so I feel like we're spending a lot of time and I know. each other in about a year or so. I know. we got to stop meeting on Zoom like this. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ernie, I mean, you and I kind of go way back. Uh, yeah. Probably 10 years ago, so, I think. At least um, 10 years, for sure. Yeah. Um, so, you, we've talked a lot about marketing over the years. You originally told me back in the day that you thought you never really could do marketing um, right. or never be good at it, at least. So how did you discover that you actually could be good and, and um, uh, you know, when, even though you thought you never could get this? Yeah, well, I mean, to me, you know, I worked in a big firm and, you know, you didn't necessarily have to bring in clients, but people who did bring in clients were, of course, more valued. But it was kind of understood that, you know, some people were good at marketing and some people weren't. And it seemed to be that the people that were good at it had a lot of social connections and, and enjoyed schmoozing. And I did not enjoy schmoozing. Um, not that I don't like meeting people, I do, but I just it seemed to me to go to a cocktail party or these various events and just make small talk was not really in my DNA. And so I just assumed, therefore, that I was not good at marketing. And um, I started this website called Ernie the Attorney as just kind of an experiment to learn about the web. And all of a sudden it blew up and people started contacting me and I was invited to speak and people wanted to hire me. I was like, oh, hmm, well, maybe I do understand something about marketing. But I, I kind of misunderstood what I understood. I thought that what I understood was if you have a website, you're automatically good at marketing, 
which definitely helps to have a website, but that was not the whole picture. Yeah. So let's talk about the website. Cause um, yeah, I love the story about, you know, you attribute a lot of your business success to a $40 weblog uh, right. way back in the day. Um, what would you say though, over time, you know, some of the, the keys to that $40 weblog becoming successful? Yeah. So what happened was, uh, first of all, I called it Ernie the attorney, not because I even referred to myself as Ernie back then. I really didn't. I referred to myself as Ernest. My father's name was Ernie. And, but there was a magistrate in federal court where I worked who had called me Ernie the attorney and she was a mentor. She was somebody who kind of taught me that you can be very serious about practicing law as you should, but you can also be somewhat playful about it too. And there's a balance. And so she used to call me Ernie the attorney as kind of like her way of, you know, joking around with me and she passed away. And because she passed away, I decided to pick that name just out of completely serendipitously while I was experimenting with this weblog. So that was one thing. And then the other thing was I wasn't really trying to market. I was just writing little blog posts about interesting things and people were like, oh, there's an attorney. And he seems to be very down to earth because what kind of attorney would call himself Ernie the attorney? And I, I didn't, you know, I didn't know that, but when people would tell me that they really liked my weblog and then they'd try to hire me, I'd say, let me get this straight. You want to hire somebody you've never met before other than through the internet. Why do you trust me in this way? It's like, well, and they, they would tell me, well, you seem down to earth. You're not like other lawyers. You, you know, all this kind of stuff that I then started had to process and realize like, oh, well, maybe what people want is more of an authentic self, you know, mm -hmm. if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I guess, what I was doing. And it seemed to work, even though I had no intention to, you know, use that for a marketing purpose. Yeah, and we've talked a lot about it before. I mean, like that idea of being authentic and that authenticity and the fact that you can get that across online. Right. right? I mean, yeah, that was the shocker. I mean, like, I, I just didn't expect that at all. I, I was just, you know, using a website and then a weblog because it was easy. It was easy. You know, like before weblogs, it was hard to have a website because you had to manage the content and move things around and decide where everything go went. But with a weblog, you know, it just roll off the, the homepage. And it was easy and it was inexpensive. It was only $40. And so I just started playing with it. I really didn't intend to go beyond 30 days because that was the free trial period. But I got so much attention and it was so interesting. And the people that I met and, you know, over the years, I've met all kinds of people that have gone on to become great friends purely because we established this relationship online. And, you know, now that's not, you know, it's not um, uncommon. People understand this. But back then, if I were to tell somebody, you know, I have this website and I'm, you know, creating relationships online, they'd be like, what kind of pervert are you? You know, that just wasn't <laughs> done. Right. It was, and you certainly didn't talk too much about it. And now, you know, everybody's on Facebook, they're on LinkedIn, you know, social media is well accepted. So the world has changed a lot in the 17 years since I started blogging. Yeah. I mean, it, it's changed a bunch, but I would still say I've, see a lot of law firms uh, and lawyers who either don't have or are reticent to really, you know, have a website or web presence. Um, so what do you tell lawyers that are, you know, reluctant to maybe have a website or enhance in their web presence? Right. Well, you know, I, I was a very enthusiastic promoter of the web early on because I saw so much benefit in it. And I still am. It's just that over over time, I've found that some lawyers, and I'm sure these aren't the lawyers that you know you would be talking to, but there's some lawyers who just don't want to be on the web. They don't want to change. They, I don't know. There's something about it that they're just still not ready for. So I don't, I don't try to push them and tell them the web's the greatest thing in the world. Although I think it is, because you know, like attorneys pay a lot of money for advertising on a billboard, or and the web is, you know, almost free. I mean, the, you know, the cost of having the the website up is very low cost. The cost of creating the website, depending on how you know intense you want to go with it, can be very little. You know, forty dollars was enough for me to begin with, and I'm sure a lot of people could get by with a hundred dollar website now. Because it's not about the fancy part. It's about are you willing to show up and be a real person? And a lot of lawyers feel like they're not allowed to be a real person. You know, they feel like they're supposed to wear a mask. And I guess my big crusade is, you know, carrying on from Michelle Wynn, who used to call me Ernie the attorney, is to say, look, you can practice law seriously, and obviously you should, but you can also show people that you have a softer side and that you're human. And that's what people want. Like, that, that was the big revelation to me. Like, you want to get more clients, and specifically more good clients, meaning ones that are compatible with you, then show people who you are, and you will get those clients. And the web is the best place to do that. Yeah, and with 
you know, the websites, but now with social media and, and you know, all these ways to interact, you know, um, people are trying to get reviews from so getting clients to give you feedback back online, right? right? So there's all these opportunities for people to, you know, go out and show everybody who they really are and, mm -hmm. and kind of attract the right type of client or, you know, the, the good right. fit type of client. Right. Um, and I do know there's, you know, a lot of people that are, you know, always scared about, uh, they ask, you know, well, you know, there's certain rules online and I, I want to like, you know, cross the ethics rules and stuff. And, and the thing is like, if you're actually doing things of just being authentic and telling your right. story and telling who you are and like that never crosses issues, you know, it's right. like, you know, like we're not saying go brag about, you know, every little detail of your client's case or, you know, like make up some stuff. It's right. just be who you are. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, there's in Louisiana where I practice law, there are rules about if you have a website and if you do certain things, then, you know, you have to run it by them and pay them $170, $75 fee for them to check it all out. And it's those kind of things that cause lawyers to think, well, gee, am I allowed to do this? And I'm like, look, let's make this simple. If you're not deceiving people, you know, if you're putting your real self out there and truly trying to help people, I guarantee you there are no regulations against that. It's it's this, but it's this, um, you know, fear and you know, uh, and I and I think part of it is subconsciously a lot of lawyers don't really want to do it, so they say, well, there's ethical rules and I don't really know what I'm supposed to do, right? So that's where the the hangup comes, and it is true that if you outsource, and I know we've talked about this, if you outsource everything just mindlessly to somebody mm -hmm. and say, well, I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just going to give it to Joe and he's going to do everything. Well, no, then you're going to get into trouble potentially because if Joe's not a lawyer, you know, Joe's just a marketer, that's a different thing. But if you're just genuinely putting out your good information, people love that. That's what right. they're looking for. Yeah, I think about that. I mean, you're right. I think sometimes it's not being worried about it. It's it's an excuse, right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Um, so you know, you're a perpetual student of marketing now, right? I mean, yeah, like for sure. when we first met, it was, you were kind of saying, oh, I'm, I don't know, couldn't be good at this stuff. And now right. you are uh, you're always talking about the latest thing you're reading or the psychology right. side of marketing and stuff. Right. Um, so what's one big thing you know now that you wish you would have known when you kind of got started? Well, I think, first of all, I think the, the best things in marketing are timeless. Like this has been the big revelation to me. It's like, it's human psychology it's what people, you know, what do people care about? What do they want to pay attention to? How do they establish trust and things like that? That's what really matters. But I will say that the web is great and all that kind of stuff, but I think email is the overlooked thing. And this is where, you know, I, I didn't use email in the beginning because I was like, well, why, why would I need to use email? I've got the website. But the thing is, people can come to your website and then stop coming or forget to revisit it. And if you have their email address and if you market to them in a you know, down to earth, tasteful, helpful way, then you can control that relationship in the sense of, you know, you can reach out to them and know that the email is going to land in their inbox. Now, will they read it? Who knows? But most people will read, you know, the emails that you send them and you just have to have a system for that. So email marketing using, you know, email service providers like MailChimp or whatever, that's, you know, that's also low cost and super useful. And I think most lawyers just ignore that. And I think that's a shame. Yeah. I, you know, we're big fans of, you know, set, setting up some kind of way to, to get an email and um, you, you can have, you don't sound like you have to like even create these monthly emails that take a lot of time. You can even create these uh, ongoing drip campaigns. You kind of yep. write once, spend the time to really get the, the information out there that, you know, somebody connects with me here. Here's right. the things they need to go down the journey to learn before maybe they're ready to hiring somebody or can really be helped. Um, like that information, you don't have to like repeat every month out of your head, right? Right. No, exactly. And it's, I mean, it is, again, it's way easier, way simpler and super low cost. But I think for most lawyers, they don't really see it. They don't understand it. And unlike the web, you know, when the web, you can go to somebody's website and see, you know, what's going on there unless you subscribe to somebody's email list, you don't know what that means, right? So I definitely recommend that lawyers go find other lawyers who have a good, um, you know, free offer in, you know, if you're an accident lawyer, you know, auto accident lawyer, go find an auto accident lawyer and subscribe to their email list and just see what happens. Cause you have to see behind the scenes to understand. And you're not going to pick up on that by just going to the website. You need to get the emails. Yeah. I mean, we, you know, even as marketers, you know, we, we do this ourselves, mm -hmm. right? So I, I've had, you know, people call us up and we're like, where, where did you hear about us? And we go look in our database and it's like, they saw us speak two and a half years ago or something. And, right. 
And it's just like, well, you know, I've been reading your emails all along and I finally am ready at the point mm -hmm. to now do this thing, you know? Right. So you know, the same thing happens for you know, any time of a customer, right? And it could be that referral that right. actually comes because somebody, you stay top of mind. Exactly. With some email. Exactly. And it's the easiest way to stay top of mind. I mean, you know, you have to reach out. You could try to stay top of mind by doing retargeting, but that's expensive. And you could try to stay top of mind by bombarding the airwaves of the, you know, the billboards, but that's also expensive. The, the easiest, simplest, least expensive way is through email. Mm -hmm. So uh, I want to get to this and make sure I, I get to talk about this. So you have an upcoming boot camp. Yeah. Um, so it's in New Orleans. So Which you will and, be speaking at. Thank and you. Thank for, you for inviting me. Like I'm <laughs> very excited coming. to come down. Um, yeah. One, to come down to New Orleans, but this event looks awesome. Yeah, um, it's going to be great. The, the other speakers you have are, mm -hmm. are you know, just high quality. Um, and the approach that you wanted to take that this is for people to walk away with you know, actionable things or with right. already have done doing something at that bootcamp. So tell me more about, you know, what you want law firm owners to take away and kind of why you got this going. Well, the reason I got it going was, I mean, I always try to create things that I feel like weren't there or still aren't there um, that I would want if I was a practicing lawyer. And I think there are several great conferences out there. We've been to them. Uh, but like, you know, for example, ABA Tech Show is just so big, right? Mm -hmm. It's like thousand people, Clio's thousand something people. And I want to have a conference that's, you know, not bigger than 150 people because there's a magic to 150. And 150 people can meet each other, get to know each other. And so that's, you know, the, the part that most people understand. Okay, we will have a conference, 150 people be there, great speakers like you and the other folks. But then the other component, which I don't see any conferences doing, is that if you sign up and register, nothing happens until you show up at the event. And to me, that's a wasted opportunity. Why don't we start teaching you now? And so when people register for the boot camp, I give them free access to my Law From Autopilot course, which has 60 plus lessons, you know, templates, checklists, all kinds of cool stuff that they can use. And then we're doing weekly webinars from now until the boot camp, which the last one was the one that you did. And it's great because you get questions from people and you learn about what they're thinking about. And so by the time they show up, they will have had some traction already, right? And then that way they get more out of that two-day event than if they just show up and say, okay, well, you know, it's the first day. What's going to happen now, right? So that's that's the biggest thing I'm really excited about. So and we were talking about marketing so far, but this boot camp, it's much more than marketing, right? Oh, yeah. You talk oh, yeah. about, you know, running your law firm autopilot. Like, what are the different type of things yeah, I mean, so to me, the solo small firm practice, you know, it breaks down to there's operations and then there's marketing and all of it involves technology. I mean, you know, it doesn't mean technology is the only thing you should care about. I definitely do not believe that, but it's an integral component of everything. And so the question is, if you're going to run your practice efficiently and effectively, how do you do that? And how do you do that with technology? So there's going to be sessions on using systems. There's going to be sessions on using voice automation. There's going to be systems on outsourcing, um, on using email better, you know, all the things that are the staples of a solo small firm practice as far as operations. And then the same is true with marketing. There'll be things in there about marketing in general, online marketing, branding, personal branding, you know, email marketing, the nuts and bolts of marketing. And there's a lot that you could cover. Two days is not going to be enough, but we have these other things, the webinars and the online materials. So really all we want to focus on during the two days are, are things that we can't do through a webinar or online resources. You know, what we can't do that way is have people together in one place and ask each other questions and learn from each other. That is something that can only happen in physical space during, you know, say two days. So right. yeah, that's, that's what we're shooting for there. And, and you mentioned that um, we were talking that you have this set up where it's not just everybody in a room getting talked at, right. there's opportunity to, to work with people, maybe whether it's the speakers or other, other law firms. Um, and then you even have like breakouts for like deeper right. dive on like, I'm interested in this. Let me raise my hand and go right. this way. Right. Yeah. Well, so the, the boot camp, um, the people that I wanted most to come to the boot camp are, are folks who are in my co-pilot coaching program because that's a monthly thing that, you know, they kind of get to know each other a little bit through the webinars and through Slack. But um, so I created this separate room, which I call the discussion room. Mm -hmm. And all of them have access to that automatically. They've got priority. Now, after they fill up that room, you know, 
I mean, there's less than 50 of them there and the room capacity is 50. Then other people, if they want to get in there, we'll figure out how we can grant access. But the idea is that room is for discussion because the folks in the co-pilot program, they don't need a presentation. You know, they, they've got all that stuff. What they need are questions, you know, helping them think through certain things. And, you know, there's a magic about being in a room where other people are asking questions and either you think, wait, that's, that's a question I should have asked, or I have a question that parlays off of that, or I want to hear these speakers talking, I see that they slightly disagree about something, or maybe they massively disagree. And there's a conversation that can happen there that cannot be produced in any other way. And so that's what that small group discussion room is going to be about. Yeah, and, and I always find those conversations enjoyable, uh, not just being there as a presenter, but being there as an attendee, because at the end of the day, a lot of this stuff, operations, marketing, that applies to any business owner. Yep. And, you know, like running an agency, it's service-based yep. business and stuff. I, I've taken a lot away from these going, oh, that's yeah. a really good way of doing that operational component. Or right. I, you know, I, I didn't know about that Zapier integration tool or whatever. Right. So like, like you know, very excited to not just be there to present, but to be there as attendees. So thank yeah, you. I mean, and the thing is like, these are all, the folks are, these are not folks who are coming to get CLE credit, although we are offering CLE credit. These are, we didn't even talk about CLE credit. These are folks who are investment minded. They have the mindset that my business is an investment. My law practice is an investment and I need to figure out how to invest wisely. And I want to get feedback from other lawyers like me and, and people who work with other lawyers like me and sponsors, you know, who have, services and products that can be, you know, beneficial to my practice. And I want to knock this out in two days. Awesome. Well, we're uh, com coming up to the end here. So be before I want to uh, you know, wrap up here on the Facebook live, and then if you don't mind, you could stick around yeah, a little yeah, bit, yeah, a few sure. more questions and we can yeah. post it on mm -hmm. Friday or something on YouTube. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so where can people find you online? I'm very easy to find online. Just Google Ernie the attorney. That's okay. worked really well for many years. Uh, and that's my main site, which is now kind of my more, it's, it's somewhat business related, but it's really my personal site. And then lawfirmautopilot.com is my business site. And so if you go to Ernie the attorney and get my, you know, free guide to how to use technology, you know, you'll be in my email list and you'll learn about all the stuff that I do, or you can go to the law firm autopilot website if you prefer to go there first. Awesome. And uh, the conference is, they could find that on Law Firm Autopilot? Yeah, it's on lawfirmautopilot.com under live events. Okay. And it's May 7th and 8th, a Thursday and Friday in New Orleans. And uh, yeah, it's going to be a blast. We have a really great hotel with a great hotel rate of $129 a night, which I think is great for solo and small firm folks. And yeah, we're going to have a blast. It's gonna be yeah, in addition to all the awesome education and yeah. leaving with knowing how to get your law firm growing, yeah, it's enormous. Yeah, it's in That's New Orleans, awesome. and we're going to have a second line parade, and we might even throw some beads or catch some beads and do some fun <laughs> stuff. Awesome. Well, uh, if you bear with me for a few minutes, and yeah. we'll come back and ask a few more questions. Awesome. Thanks, Ernie. So thanks for joining us today, everyone. So be sure to like and subscribe to our page to be notified when our next episode goes live. And smash the like button on the video now to help us with that Facebook and YouTube al algorithm. We're gonna keep going here in the GNGF studio, so be sure to check out the extended interview with Ernie on Friday, where you can learn more about Ernie's tips on growing your law firm and getting more time to do the things that are important to you. All right, thanks for sticking with us, Ernie. Yeah, sure, I'm happy to. So, so I had a couple more questions. Okay. Um, what's one big myth that you look, um, in terms of lawyers, that always believe in terms of like, you know, marketing or marketing online, running a law firm, some of yeah, the biggest I, myths. I think, I don't know if this qualifies as a myth, but I think the biggest stumbling block for lawyers is, and this is not just for lawyers, this is for everybody, um, is thinking that the way you think is the way your clients or prospective clients think. That to me is like the biggest thing. So I've seen over the years, just so many people say, well, that won't work because I wouldn't go for that. I was like, wait a second. You're not the, you're not your prospect. Right. And, and it, I've, I fall prey to this too. Like I need to really think about, well, what does the person I'm trying to speak with, how do they view the world? And it, I, you know, you don't automatically have a gift of understanding this. You need to ask people questions and really be curious about what they think. And, you know, it's, you know, one person might think one way, another person might think slightly different, but if you're really asking questions and you're curious, 
you will very quickly discover that the people you're trying to talk to do not think the way you do necessarily. They have concerns you don't have, and you should address those concerns. Yeah, and, and they approach kind of how they want to interact with somebody different. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this can go from not only the messaging, but you know, like some people are like, well, of course I have to meet with somebody in person. And you may have a whole bunch of customers that that's the last thing they want to do is inconvenience themselves to go to somebody's office. Right. Right. Where, right. you know, a lot of people think that that's exactly the way I would mm -hmm. do it. I want to see somebody face to face. I want to sit down across the desk from them. Right. Um, but yeah, so all these, all these things. So we, we've had conversations in our, in our own company about, you know, like, well, you know, like this is probably the way to do it. And like, well, let's split test it. Right. You know, like, like if, if we think this might work and somebody else thinks this might work, you know, try both. And, and it's amazing sometimes what, what resonates and you're like, huh. Right. It's all about the, well, you know, and I don't worry about data like you do because I don't have, that's not my job, but I would never hire somebody to do help me with marketing who didn't worry about it because data tells you what's true. Mm -hmm. right? You can think, you know, it's true all day long, but until you get the data, you can't really be sure. Yep. Yeah. We had a conversation with someone about, you know, like how long an email was and, you know, well, people aren't going to spend all the time reading it. It seemed very wordy. And the conversion rate on the long email was significantly higher than the more graphic, pretty short email. So let the data run it, right? Exactly. So switching gears, um, outside of marketing in general, I see you talking about technology and tools and in fact, uh, you know, when I first met you, you were Ernie, the attorney, the, the paperless office guy, right? Paperless right. law firm. Um, so tell me more about this journey on kind of going from, you know, like, like law firm to like really playing in the technology side and then marketing. And right. Well, I mean, so it was, it was back in 2000, I did commercial litigation, which were cases, you know, big, huge document intensive cases with, you know, multiple paralegals and associates and everything was just a big headache and it was very difficult logistically and paper was at the center of all this and so i um, discovered this database program called case map which is still around but it was like one of the first relational databases for lawyers and i started playing with it just to see if it could be useful and i realized like it became sort of a paint by numbers organizational tool for my data and i loved it it's like this is great and no other lawyers that i knew were using it but the other component was it let you connect to PDFs so that if you would enter data, you could say, okay, and then this is the document you would refer to it. I was like, wait a minute, let me get this straight. If I scan this stuff in, I can just have links to all these documents and then pull them up on the fly as I'm working within this database. Well, I think I like this. I want to be paperless. And I had to figure out how to be paperless, which back then was hard. Mm -hmm. And now it's super easy. And, but I mean, I knew that being paperless was better. I mean, like you could type in search terms and like the paper you're looking for would pop up in a second. And that was when I realized like as a lawyer, I was really in the information processing business. You know, most of what we do as lawyers, you know, is information processing. Yes, we have to be, you know, nice to our clients and there's social skills and things like that. But in terms of the nitty gritty of getting an edge, or you know, losing an edge, it's all about information processing as it is pretty much everywhere in the world today. So if you wanna process information faster and better, then you need to get rid of paper because that's, that's a bottleneck. Yeah, I think we've talked about, I was, uh, it, I managed in some of the early days then and when right. you know, people were talking about buying massive copying machines to scan stuff and you know, we were competing with the records room employee, mm -hmm. right? You know, like, right. The, like they do check documents in and out and stuff like physical documents in and out, not like a checkout. Like, the document management system like everybody knows today right right um so it, yeah it's come a long way really fast i mean now i got a you know scan snap on my desk and you know box.com or dropbox in the mm -hmm. cloud or whatever tool you're using i mean it's so easy now right yeah but there's still lawyers who think that they're not paperless or still wonder about how to be paperless which is just funny to me because um I've learned like the number one question, which I always get whenever I give this talk is like, well, well, isn't it impossible to be totally paperless? I'm like, well, yeah, it is impossible. And who wants to be totally paperless? The goal is not to be paperless. The goal is to be efficient. So mm -hmm. whatever paper is making you less efficient or not efficient, figure out how to get rid of that paper because there's your problem. It's not that you're going to run around and every time you see a piece of paper, you're going to get rid of it. That's not the goal. Yeah. And, and you know, as people grow, uh, I had an interesting uh, conversation with a law firm in Las Vegas, 
and they were talking about how as, as they were growing, you know, they were thought they were going to need a new office space and, and you know, they had figured out about a couple of years or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they also were going into an effort to be paperless and, you know, just getting all things scanned and getting on things in the document management system. And they ended up freeing up two entire rooms of file cabinets there you go. and realized that, well, we can wait four more years now before right. we need to, you know, cause there's room for, you know, offices for people now. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's all kinds of interesting side benefits that come along with it. In addition to like, you know, searching mm -hmm. and finding and sending stuff around and keeping track, but yeah, you know, like all those file cabinets start disappearing. Right. Totally. Yeah. So the other thing I've heard you talk about is the benefits, uh, and you mentioned, and you'd be talking about the boot camp a little bit, mm -hmm. is uh, benefits of outsourced resources. Um, yeah, you know we've, we've talked about you know call and chat operators mm -hmm. to to virtual assistants before, right? Yeah, um, give me some examples of where you've seen people you know use these uh, in some level of success. Right. So outsourcing is is you know there's a big spectrum of what you can outsource and how you can outsource, and so I always like to begin by putting things in context and saying. It's a magical world when you get it all dialed in. Um, it takes a while to get it all dialed in if you're starting from scratch. But there's some things that you can try that are low cost, that are pretty cool, like Fancy Hands, for example, is a service that costs $25 a month. You can try it for free for a little while. And then you get five tasks that somebody can do for you each month. And you can accumulate the tasks. If you don't use them all up in one month, they can accumulate. And they can be things like, uh, you know, buy some flowers for my friend or, you know, they, there's all kinds of things that people can do for you mm -hmm. on this basis. And if you start using a service like that and really, you know, diving in and thinking about the kinds of things you could offload to somebody you've never met before, that's it's a magical hands. fancy hands. Yeah. So we'll get that in the uh, chat. Yeah. And it's, and it's magical. Now the thing about it is, and I, you know, I tend, I signed up for it and kind of stopped using it. But then when I follow people who are really good at outsourcing, like for example, it's a guy named Ari Meisel, mm -hmm. who's got you know, several different books, the most recent of which is called The Replaceable Founder. And his whole, his whole point is you should seek ways to replace everything you do through outsourcing or automation. Um, he uses the hell out of fancy hands. And I'm like, well, wait a second. If this guy's using it, I, go, I need to go back. So every time I go back to it, I realize like I'm just not leveraging this as much as possible. So you really do need to be intentional about it. So that's the easy, low-hanging fruit that maybe will be hard you know, to wrap your head around. But then at the other end of the spectrum for lawyers, you know, the greatest thing to do would be able to outsource on a part-time, per-project, whatever basis, legal work that you have to do or, you know, and don't like doing or can't, don't have the time for it to another lawyer that doesn't work for you full-time. And there is a service called lawclerk.legal, yeah, yeah, I think. Tyler, I'm... Um a previous Facebook Live. So let's put a link to that, uh, yeah. you know, Daniel. Yeah, and Kristen's going to be at the boot camp, right? Because oh, awesome. to me, this is like no-brainer. Like lawyers, understand, here's a place you can outsource work. You don't have to pay anything to, to sign up. You sign up, create an account, and then start figuring out what can you outsource to these people. And believe me, the more you start thinking about it, the more you're going to realize there's a lot you can outsource. So in between those two, there's a lot of different things. But those, to me, are kind of the two no-brainer places um, to go. Awesome. Um, you mentioned this a little bit, but you now do private coaching, right? yeah. private coaching clients and stuff, which is awesome to hear. So congrats <laughs> on that. Um, Cause I mean, I, you talk about a journey, right? You know, you, would, yeah. you met when you were first getting started on understanding the marketing and trying to tell people about paper, paperless office. And now you're private coaching, you know, law firm owners who are looking to grow and scale and, mm -hmm. and, but do it as efficiently and effectively as possible to right. get their time back is one of the things I always hear you talk about is, yeah. is it's one thing to, to grow. It's another thing to, to grow in a way that's by design for your life. Right. right. Um, yeah, no, that's so key. Tell, tell me about, you know, the, the coaching you're doing now and uh, you know, like what, one of the things you know, you're getting out of it, which uh, you know, I know you've talked to how, just how exciting it is now. Um, and then some of the successes you've had. Yeah. So the coaching, uh, I wasn't intending to go into coaching. I was really thinking, well, I'll do events. Then from the events, I created an online course because people couldn't come to the event. They liked the online course. But then I realized that people have ongoing problems. There's no magic silver bullet one time course you take that you learn everything you need to know. So I created this group coaching program, which is called Law Firm Copilot, Copilot to be distinguished from the autopilot. And the Copilot program is we do a webinar every two weeks basically it's like one so two a month basically one is operations one is marketing mm -hmm. and there's q a afterwards and so we get to know each other somewhat and 
I can help people with their ongoing, you know, issues, but there's also a Slack group and I wasn't a you know, big Slack user, but when we did the last conference in 2017, we set up a Slack group and it was pretty cool as a way for people to chat. So we kept that alive. And that's also a component of the group coaching because people can ask questions on an ongoing basis and all of those questions are written. Therefore they are searchable and findable and usable, mm -hmm. you know, by anybody at a later date. And there's channels in Slack, you know, for different mm -hmm. topics and all that stuff that people who use Slack know about. Um, I do do one-on-one -on -one coaching, but I don't really, it's only for people who are in the Copilot program if they want me to do that and if I think I can help them. So I kind of, that's not really, I don't, it's not that I don't like doing one-on-one -on -one coaching. I do, but I just feel like most of what people need can be done in the group coaching program, which is more affordable for them and better for everybody as a group. So it's interesting. I mean, it's, it's a good point. There, there is no silver bullet course or book to go read. Um, mm -hmm. So the, the ongoing kind of like, you know, like, Hey, give me some help. I, I have questions come up and, and as you go through the journey of owning a business and, and running a law firm, there's just, you kind of hit a certain point and it's like, Oh, now there's questions that you didn't know you even had because right. you're in, in a new point in, in the maturity of the, the business. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's just so much that comes up and it's, and you know, it's true that things change and there's that part of it, but I don't think, I think, you know, 5% of the problems that people have relate to things that change. Mm -hmm. You know, most of it is stuff that isn't changing. It's just that you didn't really, figure out how to tap into it, or maybe you didn't realize the importance of it. And being around other people who are all thinking the same way helps you come to that realization faster, I believe. Yeah, that Slack channel would be fascinating just to see the questions other people will ask. Right. For you to kind of go, oh, yeah, I right. probably ha should have that question. Right, right, exactly. Awesome. Well, thanks for uh, sticking with us a little bit longer than our, our normal live. And Oh, sure. Yeah, we're posting this uh, on, on YouTube and appreciate you taking the time with me and I'm excited to come down to New Orleans to the, to the boot camp and, you know, see face to face. Uh, it's been a while. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, and, thank uh, you for agreeing to come. I mean, you know, you're one of the people I've followed. Your book was, uh, as I told you, I've said many times, that book was the first book when I started learning marketing and online marketing. I was like, Oh, wait a second, look at this. It's all here. You know, and there was no other book and there probably still isn't one as far as I know for lawyers, right. Especially the online part of it who just want to know, what is the scope of what I need to know? And then mm -hmm. if you want to hire somebody, you can go hire them. But I, I, my big message to people who, about marketing is don't hire anybody or do anything until you at least understand some rudiments. And your book is, goes you know, through the rudiments and beyond. So I definitely recommend that folks check that book out if they have not gotten it. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, the similar goal to kind of your bootcamp, right? It's like, mm -hmm. it's, you know, none of these things are, crazy secrets and you know like yes online stuff changes all the time we have to tweak some things but the core strategies aren't any different and there's a lot of things in there where i say you can do this on your own mm -hmm. um and here's how right uh, but if you know if you don't here's other ways to you know like outsource it or find somebody to help um and there are some things we even say here's things you shouldn't outsource mm -hmm. and here's the few things that are really complex unless you're going to spend all day all night doing it maybe you should outsource so we try to highlight that just as you know you, you do in, from the co-pilot, the boot camp yeah. and stuff as well. So similar yeah. philosophies there. Yeah. That's why we get along, Ernie. That's right. That's right. And that's why we're going to have fun in New Orleans in May. Awesome. Well, thanks again. And All right. uh, we'll catch up soon. Sounds good. Thanks, man. Hey, what's up? I'm Josh. Thanks so much for joining us. If you feel like you learned something today, think of how beneficial it would be to chat with myself or another one of our marketing consultants one-on-one. -on -one. Go ahead and visit our website to schedule your free consultation. It only takes a minute.